Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on uh, youth and prosperity. Uh, my name is Sean Rush. I'm the president and CEO of JA Worldwide. We're a youth development organization that works with about 11 million young people in uh, 120 countries around the world. Uh, just some housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, this uh, session is being webcast live, and so those of you in the audience or those of you who may be watching on the web, uh, you can pose uh, questions, uh, email, uh, you can uh, email your question or comment to youth, Y-O-U-T-H, at WEF, W-E-F, dot com. Or if you'd like to uh, post a type of tweet uh, here in China, uh, you can post to Weibo, and the hashtag uh, is pound or hash, depending upon what part of the world you come from, uh, W-E-F, youth, Y-O-U-T-H, and tweet on Twitter. Uh, it's the same hashtag. So uh, feel free during the session to pose any questions you might have. Uh, the session will be conducted in English, and so uh, those of you who need a translation, uh, your headset, you can tune to Channel 2 for Mandarin Chinese uh, and Channel 3 for Japanese. So let's get started with the session. Uh, the the uh, overriding theme of this uh, meeting of the new champions here in Tianjin is creating the future economy. And a big part of that future economy uh, is going to be youth. Uh, it's uh, human capital will be a major part of how the new economy is shaped, and youth will be uh, a huge part of that. The world reach uh, its seventh billion, billionth person uh, in uh, earlier this year, but the median age of that population is 27 which means that half of the world's population is under the age of 27. It's the biggest cohort of youth in the history of mankind. Uh, but that cohort of youth is facing some challenges due to the current economy. Uh, global youth unemployment, according to the International Labor Organization, is nearly 13 percent. 75 million youth around the world are unemployed. But there are some variations in that. You go to different parts of the world, uh, in the developed world, though that unemployment rate is roughly 16 percent. Uh, Latin America, it's uh, nearly 15, but the Middle East and North Africa hover around 29 to 27 percent. Yet in East Asia and South Asia, where we are here, it's below 10 percent in the nine. So there's huge variation, but there is a large problem around the world. Uh, there's also, I think, a mismatch of skills because as you talk to CEOs and other corporations, there are jobs available in many parts of the world, but the gap between what CEOs need in terms of skills and what's available in the marketplace uh, is great. Uh, there's also, because of this unemployment issue, a trust deficit, as some people have called it, in the traditional institutions that have served us over time. Uh, and that trust deficit played itself out among young people uh, over the last uh, couple of years through the Occupy movement, which we all saw around the world. We saw it in the Arab Spring a couple of years ago, uh, and it was uh, driven by, I think, youth disaffection uh, in those parts of the world. And now, additionally, while there's been progress against the Millennium Goals created by the UN, yet there, there are still 60 million young people around the world who do not have access to any form of education. At the same time, given those challenges, this is the most technologically sophisticated generation in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they were born on the internet, they've grown up on the World Wide Web, and they use social media and technologies in a stunning manner in ways that even the creators of those technologies didn't imagine. And yet, as we have heard here many times during this week uh, for, on different panels, this generation thinks and acts differently than prior generations, and they see the world, uh, they see business, they see employment in very novel and different ways. So with that context and that backdrop, I'd like to pose the question to our panel of how should uh, society engage young people in shaping the new economy? So I'm going to pose my first question uh, to the panel, and we have a great panel to uh, help us with that. Uh, to my left, we have Dong Jia, who is Deputy Secretary General, General of the All China Youth Federation in the People's Republic of China. Uh, to her left is Jaime Vez, 
uh, president of Asia Pacific, Japan, and Greater China for Cisco Systems in the USA. Uh, to his left is Michelle Tan Mei Yi, uh, associate at the uh, Kazana National, which is a strategic investment uh, organization uh, in Malaysia. Uh, but she's also created a think tank in Malaysia that will allow young people to begin to participate in uh, the formation of public policy. Uh, to her left is Chris Kirk, uh, who will be answering the first question. Uh, he is Chief Executive Officer of GEMS Education Solutions uh, in the United Kingdom. And finally, uh, to uh, his left is Andrea Carafa, who is Founder and Executive Director of the Green Young Economy in Belgium. Uh, two of these people, uh, Michelle and Andrea, are Global Shapers, uh, which is a group of young people in between the ages of 20 and 30 here at the Forum who have been identified around the world to, to be developed and nurtured and mentored uh, through uh, the Forum's activities. So back to Chris, uh, and let me pose that question to you, and that is, uh, how do we engage these young people in shaping the global economy given that context? Well, Sean, what I'd like to do is start by thinking about the roles that schools can play in this because uh, a lot of the interventions might come after young people have actually left education or uh, around the educational process. But I would like to suggest that there's a lot more that we can be doing actually within schooling itself. And uh, my organization works with governments and school systems right around the world. so we get quite a, a broad perspective on what's happening in this area. Uh, and in addition, uh, GEMS itself runs its own schools in, in different parts of the world. And we've really um, spent a lot of time thinking about this issue. A lot of our schools are in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, for children growing up in that region, <clears throat> uh, how you can create a world of peace is, is very much on their mind. And they're also very aware of those starts stark statistics, Sean, that you gave around youth unemployment uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, it's, it's a huge issue. One thing that really strikes us is that uh, in many ways our traditional education systems are quite broken. Uh, when you think about what it was that people needed to be able to know and do and how they would behave, uh, if you go back 20, 50, a hundred years, it was so different from the, the digital generation that are, that are growing up now. Uh, there was a point in time when in many parts of the world you would have a relatively elite tier of people for whom actually sort of knowing things that the rest of the population did not know was a mark of distinction and a lot of our education processes were geared towards giving them those advantages. And then another large group of people who were destined for the, for the factories uh, for, the, for the industrial world, uh, for whom that knowledge was not so important and actually uh, being able to perform tasks uh, in, in a certain way was important. Really, in, in many parts of the world, um, those days are either gone or they are going to be receding quickly. And we need a new kind of education. And what I'd like to argue is that that education can foster entrepreneurship and a spirit of achievement right from the start. And... Um, I'd like to argue that if we can think about the values, the knowledge, the skills, and what it is people can actually do as a result of education in a new way, we can give young people a much better start. In, in terms of values, we have to teach people that risk-taking is not only not a bad thing, it's actually a necessary and inevitable thing, and that actually being able to take risks in the right way is a key life skill these days. Uh, and not only that, but that Understanding rights and responsibilities right from the start is a, is a very practical and meaningful objective for an education system. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about youth parliaments. There are lots of different ways in which you can foster that sense of trading rights and responsibilities. Uh, for example, in, in some of our schools, uh, children would actually sit down and work out, okay, for our school, what is the carbon footprint? Um, how are we using our resources? How could we improve that? give the children a chance to work that through as a real practical and real problem, and then engage in making decisions about their schools. What are we going to trade off in order to improve this? Using the curriculum in a way that allows them to apply that knowledge to make some real decisions makes it much more relevant. In terms of, uh, of skills, um, you know, 
we can really move from a model of children in receive mode to children in switched on and thinking mode. Uh, for example, why is the teacher teaching? Actually, why do we not support children to think about how to structure a lesson, deliver a lesson, and then get feedback on the lesson? With the teacher really just facilitating and supporting that process, uh, let's think about how to help them action plan on things like waste management, practical skills like that. In terms of the knowledge side of this, you know, there are so many opportunities within the regular curriculum to embed different ways in which people can have life skills. For example, in some of the exercises I just described, maths is a really key, important topic. But if we learn it purely as an abstract, uh, children do not see the relevance of it. If they're using it to solve practical, real-world problems, not just to think about them, but actually contribute to them, then it becomes real, and they'll be much more absorbed in the process of learning the skills. And in terms of uh, beyond the curriculum, you know, why stop with mathematics, English, uh, languages? We can be fostering children who are not just drawing pictures, but are actually becoming artists and thinking about how they would create and display their own exhibitions. Uh, and, and how can they approach that both as an artist and as, as, an, as a business person? Uh, we can be creating architects who can be thinking about the design of their school. And we can be creating people who don't just learn about cooking skills, but actually want to become chefs. Uh, let's see if we can make something which we can actually sell. Let's have days when student food can be made available. And then how do we put all of that into practice? There are a number of great schemes around the world. Uh, Sean, in, in um, the, the UK, we know uh, your scheme is Young Enterprise. And um, in, in many of our different schools around the world, Young Enterprise is a fundamental cornerstone to how we get children of an older age to actually think about practical business projects. Uh, we also use the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, uh, which rewards young people for doing service in their community and applying those skills in a way that makes a difference to the people around them. I'd like to suggest if we could really support school systems to embed so many of these things into the way that children are educated right from the start, it could make a huge difference to uh, the way that young people are thinking about life. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, uh, you're uh, creating a think tank in Malaysia yes. to engage young people in the formation of public policy. Uh, what's your take on how to engage young people in the new economy? I think we need to take a step back before we think about how and think about why are youth not engaging currently. So there are two aspects to it, I think. One, that they simply are disengaged, what I like to call disengaged, which means they just don't care or don't have the capacity to care about issues concerning the world nowadays. Now, that could be because they either don't have the right, um, they don't have the kind of um, amenities to do so. So their basic concern is just to get, you know, what's next, what's my income for the next day, how do I get food? And that's the bottom, you know, bottom percent of the uh, population. Now, that requires a different approach. And the second group, are people who want to make a change. They know that they have a role to play, but they just can't play it because there is no platform to do so. And that is really what my think tank, as you mentioned, is actually trying to do. So those people I call the disenchanted youth, the people who have or want to do something, but can't do anything. Now, why are youth disenchanted? I think it's a very important question. Um, so. It could be because of your education system. Now, Chris brought up some very interesting points about investing in skills. Um, but also, we need to build the kind of character for youth, you know, to have them realize that they play a role in the world economy nowadays, but also to facilitate that kind of discussion in the schools themselves. So what happens in Malaysia is that I think it's a very Asian culture that when you are young, you're told to do what you uh, you're told to do only what you're told to do. <laughs> it's a bit of a roundabout thing, but, you know, you don't ask questions unless you are asked a question. So there is no independent thought in the process. And in Malaysia, until very recently, we had this um, Universities and University College Act, which um, prohibited students from participating in any political <laughs> activity in universities. Now, you would have thought that university students are the mature you know, students who would be able to engage in good discussion. But if you have that kind of restriction, you're actually inhibiting independent thought. And that is a very, very key 
part of learning and growing up as youth. And also, um, the Asian culture I mentioned, you're not allowed to ask questions. So how are you going to ask the big issues that concern us today? How are you going to say, well, what about this new idea or that new idea? Because you have no way of expressing yourself or you're just not encouraged to. So that is a very important you know, issue that we should address as well. And um, so it's very important to provide a platform for students because nowadays, youth who feel that they can't um, assist in anything to do with public policy, they'll think, well, why do I stay in this country? Why not just go abroad? You know? So we have a lot of Malaysian students who uh, migrate overseas after they study because you know, they think that there are better opportunities for them to contribute elsewhere. So the first step to engaging youth, I think, is to provide the kind of platform for students who are disenchanted make them realize that um, there is a role to play and we are listening to you. So don't dismiss students as just you know, people who are young and inexperienced because to be honest, there is a lot that we can learn from them. Great. So it's, you're saying create a platform, create a vehicle right. for them to provide input. Yeah. Uh, Dong Jia, uh, dep your Deputy Sep Secretary General of uh, uh, the All China Youth Federation, you reached 300 million Chinese youth. Uh, tell us your perspective from the People's Republic. Okay. I think um, engaging young people is one of our missions as an umbrella organization through our 55 member organizations. But I think starting from this conference, we are not only to engage young people, but we should also making young people take the lead. Uh, Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao made uh, his definition of what is new champions in his opening remark. Young people is one of the four elements that he mentioned first. Actually, we find that uh, the audience here, I think, is a good complex uh, mix of both young people and uh, senior, uh, senior participants. I'm one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Because engaging young people is not enough. That's what I, I think from Chinese view, that we, we should make young people take the lead. Uh, from our experiences, we think that um, uh, engaging young people is not a contemporary or temporary solution. It should be an attitude, a commitment. What we need most is resources is mentioned, uh, capacity is mentioned, but what I think most is a culture. A culture which is, think young people is the resources, not the problem. Think young people is not only the future, but also the now. Which a uh, culture that giving, empowering young people and giving them um, not only um, uh, importance by uh, voices, but also their real power in decision making Process so the political structure, the um, the, co the social culture, and the policy processes. All these are needs to be built together to build a, a system which can um, enabling young people to take the lead uh, and engaging them. If or, or in some areas, if you can't give them a favorable condition, at least you give them equal opportunities. So that's the general, because I, I always have the feeling that this iPad generation, they knew more than us about what is new economy, but it is the adult who don't use iPad, or who don't use all this Weibo, who is making decisions. So it's not a time about only engaging, but how to you retreating and giving young people more flow. So, I mean, one of my takeaways from that is that you're viewing young people not as a problem, but as a resource. I mean, uh, how do you... Culturally, for China, it is. If you see Chinese history, not the old part, if you see the republic history of China after our, uh, we, we abandoned the empress in the early 20th century, it is youth movement. It is young people taking the lead in setting up the republic, in setting up the People's Republic of China, in starting up the reform and opening up a process of China. It is this youth movement, maybe, maybe not in the typical form 
of a revolution, but in a form of fully engaging, participating, taking the lead, having a career ladder in their careers. They have hope. And I think uh, that's consistent with uh, what Premier Wen Jiaobao said uh, uh, in his opening remarks to the forum, where they're providing free compulsory education through grade nine here in China, and they're providing financial aid. Yes. Uh, so that no young person would have to drop out of school due to poverty. Mm -hmm. So it's a consistent message. Mm -hmm. So, Jaime, uh, you're from Spain. You were educated in Mexico. Uh, you've worked for a number of technology companies, but right now Cisco for quite a period of time. Uh, you have overseen operations in Latin America. You're now overseeing those operations here in the, uh, the, the east. Uh, so you have a unique perspective uh, on a lot of different things. And from Cisco's perspective, Talk a little bit about how the world should be engaging young people. So let, let, me, let me try to frame this in the context of two or two things. First, the tremendous opportunity we have for the younger generations. And I understand that we all talk about unemployment, but I try to frame it more as an opportunity for them. Second, what are the key things that the industry and the governments are doing in general to pretty much address the mismatch that you talked about but third, also, what are the younger generations expecting from the industry, from the companies, in order to be successful? And um, you, you mentioned that I've had a opportunity in Latin America and Asia, but everywhere I go, every meeting that we attended, we talked about talent scarcity. It is a fact that the companies are talking that talent today is not enough to drive the technology, create the infrastructure that has to be put in place to make our countries more competitive and in order to drive productivity. Obviously, technology, we believe, is one of those key enablers of productivity, and we face these challenges of talent scarcity on a daily basis. Now, we feel it, but what's the data behind it? So just let me share two data points that are critical. I'm using IDC information and manpower information. Number one, Latin America, in order to deploy all the technology required just in communication, today needs over 150,000 people to deploy the basic technology. Second, in a manpower analysis survey 2012, 34% of 40,000 companies that were interviewed believe that they have difficulty in gathering talent to meet their needs. Now, the first, the double click on this one is where? And the first reaction would be emerging markets. But let me share which are the, uh, some countries out of the top 15. Japan, US, Germany, Brazil, India, Mexico. It's all over the place. It does not really differentiate if it's developed or emerging. And an interesting data point, in 2010, 10% of the companies interviewed in the US said they had difficulty. 2012, 49% believe that they're having issues to hire people. So what a tremendous opportunity for the younger generations. And it's summarized in three concepts, skills mismatch, experience mismatch, and location mismatch. And that's why this is such a huge opportunity for younger generations because of the flexibility, adaptive capacity, and ability to learn that younger generations have today. Now, what are the solutions, obviously? Leverage technology to be global. Just move people from one place to the other or hire virtual via technology so you can actually do the job in other places of the world. Second, retrain and retrain and retrain. Companies are doing more and more training of people, not only for themselves, but for the industry. Cisco in this case, that's something we call Cisco Networking Academy. Sean, you and I talked about it in the past. Over 250,000 younger people are being trained today on APJC on a yearly basis. That's the investment we have to make for the future. And there are ideas like, you know, um, get getideas.org, training for the 21st century, where the industry is together working with government and with academia to train people to minimize the skills mismatch. So obviously a lot of opportunity and solutions being put in place by companies leveraging technology, but with a commitment to deploy those resources. But let's assume for a second that we have everybody, all the younger generations in our company. What is the challenge we face? It's not only hire, it's retain them. Because younger generations' expectations are completely different. It's not about the desk, the computer, and the chair. It's about bringing their own device, 
having the opportunity to work from anywhere, being connected 100% of the time, and their management expectation, expectation from their management is not you're going to tell me how to do it. You're going to give me the opportunity to do it by interacting with multiple people in the company and outside the company in a collaborative way so you can actually get the results of what I do. Driving tremendous innovation. For that, I want to say what Michelle said. It is the company role to build the platform to enable these younger generations to be successful so we capture the innovation, we let them be actually be successful and really grow together with them. So it's also putting the platform for them to enable them for a future in the, in the companies. So what I hear you saying, Jaime, is that there are great opportunities, there are jobs, but for reasons of geography or skill sets, there are mismatches and there needs to be some way to bridge those mismatches Absolutely. in the re relocation. All right, Andrea, uh, you are Italian. You're working in Belgium, but you see the world uh, in what you're doing. Uh, you are, uh, have created uh, uh, the Green Young Economy Organization, which is a not-for-profit organization uh, that's designed to empower young people to innovate around the topic of sustainability. Uh, what is your take on how to engage young people? You're a global shaper as Michelle. Uh, you're part of the generation we're talking about. Uh, talk to us. I think the the very the very first point is again how to inspire young people to take action, how to motivate them, how to fuel action, because probably the concern we are facing today is that young people have lost this motivation, as have lost really the passion that usually young people should have. So. As I said yesterday in the session on the future of education, one day I was asked, who was your best teacher ever? I thought about it only for a few seconds, and then I realized that it was a peer, and he was even a couple of years younger than me. And actually, I think probably one of the reasons why I'm here today is that this friend of mine, because now we are friends, he managed to inspire me. So, probably we should start recognizing the role of young people in teaching, not only peer-to-peer -peer teaching, but actually, you know, giving young people ownership of what they are teaching. Let's, let's imagine um, students in a business school giving a class, a course, uh, to students in an engineering school, and vice versa. And um, let's imagine, for example, uh, students who start their own youth organization, giving a class to students in another school or in a faculty. Um, and I think we can go beyond this uh, just by by underlining the the reason why this should be done. Young people are able to engage with other young people more easily. Mm -hmm. They are able to inspire them because they can lead by example. Basically, you know, when I was with this peer, I was inspired because he's like me but, and he's doing great things, so he just made me think I can also do the same things. I, I'm not saying that uh, more experienced people cannot inspire, but they have a main difference that they have experience. So young people will think, oh, I don't have that. Maybe I cannot achieve what this person achieved. There's another concept, that, an approach that I'm trying to promote, and it, this is intergenerational innovation. So bringing together different generations to innovate and tackle issues. And more specifically, I'm proposing to bring together um, company employees, or anyways, people who just retired, and students who are about to graduate to play together, for example, innovation games, mm -hmm. solve issues, and actually, you know, this is a way to have fun because you're gaming, but it, it can be the beginning of something bigger, a project and a profit, a startup, a patent. Now the point is that this way we can address different issues, not only youth unemployment, but also the social marginalization issue of uh, 
people who are retiring, and we can focus on uh, issues like sustainability. Not only, actually. And the link between this is networks. That means that uh, when people are retiring, their networks, they ne their network ties uh, are fading away. So we are offering them a way to keep them, their network ties alive. Because basically, there might be this young person who's got this great idea, uh, and uh, you know he just needs connections, resources to be to be mobilized. So these people who just retired can get back to their own um, previous company and say, "Yeah, you know there is this, this this young person. Let's employ him or let's support his startup." In many different ways, this can be possible. Thank you. Um, let me invite the audience to begin considering some questions. Uh, if you'd like to email it to us, I have an iPad here. I can uh, see it. If you email it to youth at wef.ch uh, or on Weibo, uh, hashtag wef youth, and the same hashtag for uh, Twitter. By the way, it's uh, hash pound wef youth, excuse me. But I see a common thread or hear a common thread amongst all of these panelists, even though you're coming from slightly different places. Chris is talking about new and innovative ways of delivering education. Uh, Andrea is talking about using, connecting young people to young people to learn from each other as well as uh, the older generation and the younger generation, but providing a platform to do that. Michelle talked about a platform to engage Malaysian youth in the creation of public policy. Jaime talked about a platform where interaction can take place in a corporation, and you're talking about uh, uh, ja, uh, the, the use of your organizations and your federation to engage young people in the development of China. So wh where, where do we take this? How do we uh, use, for example, Chris, these kinds of platforms in the redesign of education? That's a, a great question. Um, we've been uh, really focusing on this question of uh, how education can be delivered. Uh, and uh, Jaime would be um, uh, more expert than me on the, uh, the implementation of this, but uh, we've been looking at the concept of blended learning in, in a lot of detail. Um, I think we know a couple of things now. One is that um, the purely traditional, if you like, sort of uh, what we would call chalk and talk method of teaching uh, with a teacher in a classroom uh, is not only um, unnecessary anymore, but it's pretty, a pretty ineffective way for people to learn. Um, but we also know through, um, for example, completely online learning in, in the U.S. that actually just learning sitting in front of a computer terminal, even though you might be networked and uh, linked to a lot of very creative resources, is also not really a way to um, fundamentally learn because uh, one also needs the opportunity for social interaction and for deeper debate. So how can we put together the best of these different modes of learning? And um, uh, there are blueprints now emerging which can really sort of show how you can get the really higher order skills of learning happening face to face in the classroom, facilitated by peers as much as by, uh, as by teachers um, who will have a completely different role as, as mentors and coaches and not transmitters of knowledge. That can be done. If I could just take it up a level though, and you know, we're at the World Economic Forum, I think we're allowed to think big, um, perhaps think a little bit. Um, you know, away from the normal sort of um, allowed territory. I think there are three things I'd like to say um, that, that pick up on what the panel have said, and this is about sort of macro government policy as well as the micro stuff that we can do in the classroom. Uh, first of all, uh, it is true that education remains one of the last sort of undisrupted areas of delivery, and I personally believe it's no coincidence that education systems have not kept pace with the way that other industries have revolutionized how they work. I think governments are going to have to get very brave and really liberalize the supply side of education and allow it to be delivered in many different ways, in much more creative ways, not just by government organizations, but by not-for-profits, by private organizations. And whilst, of course, we're talking about vulnerable young people and therefore we need regulation, uh, we should also think about how to get as much liberalization as that delivery as we can. 
I think what we'll see then is education that becomes much more bite-sized. I think we'll see much less of a division between education and the workplace. We'll see the growth of apprenticeships as a perfectly natural way of people learning skills. We spend a lot of time in school de-skilling people from the things that they're going to need once they enter the world of work. Why? Why would we do it like that? So I think that liberalization. And finally, just to um, really think about the macro policy. You know, we do have these pockets of uh, skills deficits and pockets of youth unemployment. Um, it seems pretty obvious that governments are going to have to um, think long and hard about any remaining barriers to the movement of, of people uh, from, from one place to another, because if we're going to solve this as a world, we need to think not about um, which slice of the pie do different countries actually have, but actually if we can all break down trade barriers, break down the movement of people and goods from one place to another, together we'll actually grow the world economy and therefore these issues will start to solve themselves. On the topic of uh, one of the institutions that hasn't changed very much in the world, the, at the session yesterday on education, uh, the provost of Carnegie Mellon University said that uh, higher education hasn't changed dramatically in a thousand years, uh, to which uh, Gordon Brown, uh, the former prime minister of the United Kingdom, responded, in England they always say the first 500 years of any institution are the toughest. So, uh, Do we have questions from the audience? Has anybody... Uh, have an idea. Yes, sir. Uh, we, oh, uh, we need to put on our headsets. May I speak Japanese? Uh, hold on. Uh, now, I am Islam International Rotary. My name is Naksa Rota. We at uh, International Rotary trying to develop youth, and uh, we have interactive clubs. Uh, of about 150,000 uh, uh, mainly high school students. And we have Rotary Clubs. Again, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of participants. We have activities globally. And we have a system for foreign students, international students. Uh, we have exchange of students uh, globally. Now, uh, my question is about uh, international students. Uh, any experience or input in terms of sending young people overseas for training or education outside their own countries? Uh, did everybody get the question? Uh, for those who didn't may have a headset on, the question is, what is our experience? Uh, uh, the gentleman is from Rotary International, I, I believe he said. And the question is, what is uh, everybody's experience with international exchanges uh, of students and giving them uh, a more global perspective? Who would like to take that one? <laughs> yeah. yeah. OK. I think um, when we talk about education or capacity building uh, for a new economy or for all the uh, challenges that we are facing, what we need to address more than before is experience learning and peer education, as um, Andrew already mentioned. Experience learning and peer education can only be achieved through platforms like this, through uh, international exchanges programs, and through uh, youth-initiated organizations and uh, programs. So I think any approaches that we can enhance more experience education, peer education. This is a way to build um, a kind of deconstruct de, uh, the, the old one and build a new one. And we, we did a lot of in that area and uh, from my federation and uh, in China, because China is one, one of the biggest um, demanding country for uh, sending students to study overseas. We, we are the biggest foreign uh, students now even in, in the UK and in Europe, in the USA. I find this process of um, um, going abroad to study, uh, going back to China, or they stay uh, abroad. This is a very constructive process. They, they contribute to the to the uh, modernization process of China, and they also contribute to the integration process of uh, 
China's uh, ideas and Chinese uh, mindset with the world. So we have uh, students exchange programs, a very big one, and with Japan, China, Japan, we have big scale youth exchange and students exchange, and with Europe, with uh, the U.S. I think from the government commitment, there is a strong will and uh, a big investment in that direction. And there are a lot of um, uh, grassroots organizations and international NGOs like Junior Achievements, uh, they are doing that. And I find all this a very constructive way. And I think these uh, are not uh, should be invested by the governments. Should we have more investment from the business sector? Because investment in education, if it is only from government, sometimes is a little bit delayed from the market. So we need more shareholders. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jaime, this plays right into you. You raised your hand. Uh, this whole connection between the business sector uh, and uh, the educational sector and youth development organizations. Go ahead, Jaime. So let, let me share what I was going to say before and then try to answer the gentleman's question with a probably different approach. I think governments, companies, have a lot of opportunity to send people outside. But it's limited. It's limited to a certain percentage of our population. But we believe that younger generations deserve 100% of opportunity. The truth is, let's not underestimate the power of younger generations. Let's not underestimate their drive, their hunger to learn. And today, they are connected with the world. We're moving in a world where billions of devices are connected to a world where trillions of devices are connected. These younger generations are already living and connecting with peers with younger people all over the world. They see the internet and their social peers as an extension of their brain. They actually do not need to be in another part of the world in order to be connected. Video and collaboration tools are already connecting them and they're already crossing, you know, bridging cultural differences by interacting with others. Within the company, Sean, you said, it is exactly the same. Companies to their moving people are leveraging people's talent by using technology to connect, but also then, and this is something that is very important, we're actually more and more providing tools within the companies. You have Facebooks within the company. Tools today offer the same experience within the companies, so social networking actually happens, and you build the platform that Michelle talked about in order to capture that innovation. And Chris, you said something that was critical. You said, we talk about training younger generations. I think we have to train management to better develop younger generations in an effort to take risk, to drive innovation and let people collaborate in order to be successful. And that's within the companies and honestly outside of the companies also. Andrea, you had a response to the question. Um, just a quick uh, comment regarding uh, we're え、国際的な情報への え、勝負
私の iPad に入ってきてませんのでスクリーンで出してもらえますでしょうか。その一つですけれども。多くのヨーロッパの国々は教育システムとビジネスニーズをつなげているけれどもそれでも青年の失業は高いとその経験から学ぶものは何だろうかとどなたは答えてくれますかまず努力をしますやってください複雑な問題だと思うわけですね需給とサプライデマンドということですから経済のサイクルもあるわけでリードタイムと非常にもずれますから多くのヨーロッパの国々が今発見していることですけれども全部とは言いませんけれども失業の高い国なんかにおいてはそのスキルベースを金融サービスだけに行ってしまって、その製造部門の方を手放してしまっているわけですね。この5年間、それが見られていると思います。それからサービス産業でも、経済の4つのシリンダーで需要を作ろうということをやっているということでありますから。ということは、若い人たちの一つの世代というのは、知識とスキルはあるけれども、業界に使ってもらえないということになってしまうわけです。一方で、その産業を起こす力が使われていないと、ですから起業家精神ということが大事だと思います。他の人のビジネスを助ける、そこで働くんではなくて、自分でビジネスをどう起こすかということです、起業するかと。5つ,つの新しい起業したビジネスのうち4つが失敗してしまうという話がありました。ですから、企業を起こすということは。
and I want to add a little ahead, bit please. to to the first question about the training because I think it's very important one for for um, for for, for this, the whole society to realize that um, de, de, uh, supply is one side, so training education, but demand is another side. So uh, from China's experience, we find that the government's role in generating jobs, the content of uh, employ, employment is very crucial. So you have to build an economic structure where the contents and the the numbers of employees are considered as a high priority in the uh, economic agenda. The International Labour Organization once had a study finding that in the past 10 years or 15 years, the world economy is developing, but the contents of employment is not developing. So that leads to the problems that we see in, in many parts of the world. So for, for generating jobs, from the demand side is very crucial. And generating a culture and an environment conditions for young people to start businesses is also very important. They can employ themselves. They can be a business owner themselves. So spiritually, entrepreneurship, conditionally, capitals, experiences, networks, mentorship, all these are needed to build a, a larger demand side. Very good. Thank you. A question from the audience. Yes, we have it. it. Will it be in English or? Thank you. Well, can we get a microphone to this uh, very nice woman here? Thank you. Thank you for calling me nice woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm also from Rotary International. I, and I don't know whether this is a good place to ask or not, but uh, first of all, I would like to tell you a little bit about Rotary International. Because we have the largest youth program, we are very into youth. And just on the uh, last Council on Legislation, we passed youth as the fifth avenue of service for Rotarians. And so Rotary is a conglomerate, uh, the membership of the Rotary are uh, all from the business leaders or the community leaders. So listening to you, how as an organization of Ro as such as Rotary International, how our program or our project can enhance or collaborate with you in businesses to um, have a better world? I think that's basically my question. So that's a great question. I know from the perspective of my own organization, we would love to collaborate with Rotary. And in fact, we're actually having those conversations. Uh, but I think... Uh, I'd put this out to the panelists. I mean, this is a way to engage uh, business people, essentially, who are part of Rotary International in the engagement of young people. How do you, and it's not just Rotary. I know you asked about Rotary, but it's organizations like Rotary and other business and civic organizations. So who would like to take it? Michelle. Um, yeah. I think uh, Rotary International can start with an online platform. Again, back to the online virtual world thing. Um, I was speaking to one of the Global Shapers yesterday in a session, and he had this fantastic online micro-donation system, which enables collaboration between charities and businesses, and using celebrities as a way to get youth to be involved in a certain cause. So in that sense, I mean, Rotary International, with what it does, it can engage with online, uh, online with youth, very simple, very easily, but you know, making sure that you get the right uh, message across as well. Uh, I think also, uh, you know, it's there's much to be said for mentoring and role modeling uh, for young people, and it gets to Andrea to some extent. Not to say that all Rotary members are part of an older generation, but they are older typically than the students they are mentoring, and so you know, there is a way to use these kinds of organi organizations to fulfill your desire to connect, at least in part, the older generation with the younger generation. Uh, we're beginning to run up on time. We have about uh, six minutes left. And so I'm going to ask each, each of you, um, to, in 30 seconds or maybe 45, I'm saying 30 so you slip to 45, uh, what is your number one takeaway from the conversation that we've had this morning? So let me, I'll give you a Five seconds to formulate it in your head, and then I'm going to call on Andrea. Five seconds. Five, well, it was three. But. It's enough. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I think um, probably there's something underlying what we are talking about, which has not made fully explicit, 
And it's the fact that actually young people can inspire other generations. So we're not talking anymore about young people being the ones who execute tasks. Please do that. You're the young kid. Do that. No, please, you young kid, inspire me. Give me your input because you are closer to, to fresh trends. You can be actually the only source of certain inputs. And the other dimension is risk and failure. Failure is not a, anymore a problem. Anyone it's a good can thing fail. In many ways. You learn from it. This is a way of learning. That's it. Great. Chris. I think what struck me is um, the importance of making connections, um, and particularly making connections between young people and, uh, and older generations. There's two-way learning that can come from that. Um, certainly, I'd be delighted to um, have a discussion about how the schools and government systems we're working with could link more to the, the Rotary um, and see if that's one way to uh, improve that. But as a more general point, I think providing those connections um, there was a really interesting piece of work on creativity and uh, the, the trend of how creative people are with age sort of is like a camel with two humps and um, apparently the least creative point in our lives tends to be around sort of um, early to mid 40s. Won't embarrass the panel by asking others where they sit there but um, it, I'm, I'm firmly in the seat. Um, and um, so <laughs> if, we the have, hump. <laughs> if we can have more connection uh, at both ends of that hump and perhaps the people in the middle just need to facilitate that, then uh, maybe that'll change the way things work. Because at the moment, we tend to focus a lot of the uh, structures around the middle. Great. And uh, maybe that's going wrong. Thank you. Michelle? I think what struck me was when Andre was talking about how a peer influenced him the most. I think the power of peer networks is really, really crucial um, in engaging youth as well as, you know, making them aware of stuff. So if we can empower one youth, imagine the number of other people he can empower. And I think that's something that we should look at in a more, you know, deeper perspective. Hi, mate. So for me, the, the message is, number one, there's tremendous opportunity for younger generations. Tremendous. The second one, I want to build what you said. Yeah. It's our responsibility to create the platform for them to be successful both in the business environment and in the social environment. The next topic that I believe is critical, academia, government, industry together, working on set or define the skill set that are needed. And in this world of hyper-connectivity, how can we enable them you know, to better collaborate with peers in this ambition that they have to learn more and more on a daily basis? There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of innovation, and a lot of risk that they're going to take in order to make us more successful. And if you give me 10 seconds, just two very fast thoughts. Number one, I was hired over telepresence. I was hired virtually. My boss lived in London, and I was in New York. And so far, it seems so good. So I can tell you, it, it is a fact that technology can help us be more successful, but let's never forget the importance of human interaction in this world in which we're going into. Mm. Yeah. Uh, if you want to engage young people, you have to engage the others. So the, the, the seniors, the business people, and the government. And you have to engage young people professionally because uh, there are a lot of techniques and experiences, knowledge is building to that process. So we need to work with professionals and professional organizations or expertise in that area. That's great. And, and my takeaways in a, an attempt to summarize the panel is uh, I've, I came away from this with more hope than I walked into it. Um, it's, it's a tough world out there for young people these days, but uh, my takeaway is on this whole intergenerational and uh, uh, aspect of it, and it's it's the peer to peer, but it's who's a peer. I mean, you know, a peer can be a young person to an older person, or it can be an older person to a younger person. It's not so much how old you are; it's what you can learn from each other that counts. And the key to that is really providing uh, retooled educational models, platforms by which. Uh, uh, various generations and individuals can interact, and those platforms can be virtual, they can be uh, physical, but that the key is human interaction, back to Jaime's point, and a question of how do we facilitate those human uh, interactions across generations and among peers. 
So with that, I want to thank my panel. It was a great and lively discussion. I'd like to thank the audience for coming in early this morning after the cultural soiree last night, uh, when some of you, I'm sure, uh, were out a little bit later than you expected. And uh, I'd like to thank the WEF for the opportunity to run this panel. So thank you very much, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Now, uh, I've been asked to, to ask people to hurry getting out of the room, because they actually, at, in a half an hour, they're having a television show in here, and they've got to retool the set and other things. So uh, thank you very much.